Susie Bell. I'm on the board of directors at Asians in Advertising, and I know everyone's had a long day, but all the sessions have been just fire. I, I hope you're able to catch some or all of it. Um, I'm so inspired, and thank you so much, all the behind the scenes crew and team, especially the tech, <laughs> Aaron, Kat, um, Ariba, Sina, and Bernice just emceeing through this whole thing. So um, we're just so excited to put this together and I hope everyone's having a great time, learning a lot, making connections. Um, so today, you know, so far we've had a lot of inspiring conversations and uplifting, but I think one of the big cultural barriers as Asian Americans is you know, we're, we're told don't rock the boat, don't speak up. And, you know, we're, we're not one to, you know, do, you know, like confrontations. I mean, who likes them, but, um, and we're told, no, you, you need to deal with it, but how, how, how should we deal with it? You know, no one, everyone tells us to do it, but no one really explains how we should do it. And I'm happy today to be a moderator for this um, very important discussion is how do we navigate difficult conversations? And I'm here today with um, two amazing speakers, Jennifer Cole from VML YNR. She is a C-suite woman of color in the advertising community. So bravo to that. And we also have Feng Tao Nguyen, who is not in a traditional advertising role, but she plays a very important part in this conversation. And she's the founder of the Uncaged Path. So I'm gonna hand it off to um, the two of you to introduce yourself to this audience. Let's start with Jennifer. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having us. It's amazing to be at this inaugural event and sort of being groundbreakers and barrier breakers. It's great. Um, so as Susie said, I am the executive director. I lead all of our um, U.S. paid media for VML YNR. I've been within the WPP family for most of my career. So I am a media girl by trade and I think a really sharp businesswoman. Um, in terms of my Asian background, it's sort of a little bit um, you know, unique in the sense that my mom is Chinese and my dad is German. I'm actually first generation American. So I was raised by a Chinese mom and a German dad. So I have a really, I think, unique uh, view of the world, sort of that hapa or half half um, sentiment, being multicultural and sort of growing up first gen. And uh, I love sort of exploring that. And I think when I was young, it was really not something I was super proud of, but as I've gotten into my adult life, it's been definitely something that I'm really happy to share and happy to uh, dialogue about all day long. Hi everyone, my name is Feng Tao and I'm a certified Rebloom coach and also a somatic, practitioner, somatic experiencing practitioner in training. So for those who are not aware of what somatics mean is basically, um, working with the body, specifically the nervous system, when we have a lot of different wired responses that happens. So in this realm, I support a lot of folks, especially when it comes to trauma and leadership. And how do you resolve what's stuck in your nervous system and completing it and then creating more space and more possibilities from that place, from an embodied place. And um, my Asian background is I'm this is something I learned recently in the last week as I'm a 1.5 generation Vietnamese immigrant because I immigrated over here when I was about one years old with my mother to the US and I'm the eldest of five siblings, eldest daughter. And so there were a lot of responsibilities placed on me as the role model, like the perfect Vietnamese daughter. Now my parents passed down the shame um, tool uh, because that's what they experienced was like, if I'm not the perfect eldest the daughter, then they're gonna shame me. And then they would use me to get my younger siblings into place. But also like, so just learning to like break that as well. Cause we, that's something that stays within us. And um, 
and then this really showed up in a lot of ways in terms of like my upbringing, again, my parents, a lot of Asian parents, just a disconnect with emotions. We learned to repress it and crying was a thing too of like I, vulnerability was not a thing growing up. And so I had to learn to re come back into relationship with my emotions because oftentimes what I've learned and with many folks is like a lot of decisions people are held back is because fear, guilt, and shame shows up. So how do you work with the fear, shame, and guilt to move through that and to the other side? So, all right, I got off topic there, but that's just the gist of what I do when I just, and I love supporting people to come back to be embodied and empowered and really it's coming back into relationship with your body and emotions and repatterning your mind so that's it for me you're really actually not off topic because um you know what we're going to talk about is microaggressions and gaslighting and i think just just yesterday i was talking to a colleague of mine he happens to be an older white Caucasian executive. And I mentioned like, oh, I'm taking the next two days off. I am, you know, involved in the summit and I'm actually, and I happen to have had a couple of difficult conversations at work lately. And I, and what we were discussing that conversation, I said, uh, ironically, I'm moderating a panel about um, difficult conversations and microaggressions. And he said to me, I think people are just oversensitive these days. I mean, like, what is microaggression? I think people are just, you know, just too sensitive. And I was just pause and like, well, I think it's because <laughs> you haven't experienced it or maybe you were the one, you know, doing the microaggression. But I would love to hear your definition and maybe an example of, you know, of what you experienced in your workplace or your life. So let's go with you, Jennifer. Yeah. I mean, it's, I sort of wrote in the chat, this, this word microaggression for me is relatively new, you know, in the last, let's say year, year plus. So when I sort of heard it and started to understand it, I realized, wow. So that's the wrapper I can put around all those moments that have happened to me across my life that you sort of feel like, did someone mean it in the meanest, cruelest way? Maybe not but it was like exactly the word micro. It was a tiny aggression that sort of chips away at your soul over time. And because we as Asians in general, not everybody tend to be a little bit more subtle and subdued and quiet. And we sort of take it on the chin, especially when you're of immigrant, um, you know, an immigrant situation, which many of us are. So I think, you know, I've had, you know, these sort of moments where someone will say, well, of course you're good at analytics and math, you're Chinese to me. Knowing now as an adult, like that's a microaggression. Like I, I, those assumptions about me because of my heritage are, is a form of microaggression. You know, I've had situations even with my, you know, I have two children. And I remember an instance where I was asking my son and his friends like, hey guys, what do you want? It's Friday. What do you want for dinner? I'll order pizza or Chinese food. And this one kid, his beautiful, you know, doctor parents, he grew up in a very nice household, he says, well, I don't like dog for dinner. I don't eat dog. I'm like, wow. Okay. So those are like, I mean, that's probably more than a microaggression, right? So yeah. those moments and you're sort of like the, the reaction you both had sort of like dumbfounded by some of this. So it's not necessarily a racial slur. Like that's definitely more of the, you know, very aggressive, but these micro moments that happen or when someone in business says, well, <clears throat> we, we need to, you know, think about casting in the room. And we need to make sure we have a woman or someone of color or someone of minority descent, you know, like casting, like, I don't want to be cast in a room. I want, I want to be there because I'm the right person with the right skill set. So that sort of, um, and I think what you said, Susie was really, really on point. People don't understand it if they haven't experienced it. And that to me is really so important about these kinds of panels and these kinds of conversations is because if you've never been on the receiving end, you can't possibly understand what it's like to be in that, in that position. Exactly. And, and I told them that something similar where it, it may not be, it might be subtle, but it's that re repetition of those subtle, you know, 
not quite insults, but just Correct. stabs. And someone put in the chat, I love that explanation. It's like a mosquito bite, but all over your body over time. <laughs> yes. Um, it it's away at you. It really does. It's just yeah. chip, chips and it really, it, it, it stings. It's not like it's, a, you know, a stab, but, and, and it can be, it can really hurt over time and grow. And Fung, how would you describe microaggression and um, how have you experienced it? Well, this is something I also learned relatively new in the last two years. And for me, the way that I see it is someone that's of historically a dominant group and then negating someone of a marginalized group. And so I'll share like a everyday life example. And this happened like two, actually a little more than a year ago. And I was a dental patient at a student clinic. And it was overseen by a dental faculty member. And this person was older, white, and a man. So all those three identities of a dominant group. Now, you got to, I was also mindful about, okay, so what happened was like, he touched my shoulders a couple of times as he was talking, which is like, for me, it was like, that's not normal of a dentist. Usually this is the area that they interact with. So in that moment, I froze because that was just what my body it was like, okay, this is a new experience. And also like my conditioning from the past was like, my parents told me like, you can't say no to your elders. You can't say no to adults. And especially growing up in America, like with the way that you respond with white folks. So all of those different dynamics. So like the survival response or freeze and then that. So I went to a freeze. And then by the time I got home, eventually I slowly came out of the freeze and then I was in rage. Now, <laughs> anger and rage is something I've come back into relationship with over the last two years, just because that's also another emotion that, especially as a Vietnamese girl, I was not allowed to express. And so I learned to repress that. So slowly I come back to relationship with it. And, but it was too, the rage was like enormous. I felt like a volcano about to erupt, but I know from past experiences and from what I help folks is if I don't go slow and if I don't have some kind of containment in a way that is doable to be with the rage, it will flood my nervous system and I'm going to go in a deeper freeze and I can't mm. access the rage as much. So I, um, I still work with my somatic practitioner and she held that session with me to access that rage so I could fully complete it. So two weeks, so I had a follow-up two weeks later. And this is where the microaggression happened was um, there was another faculty dental member, also white, older man. And I told him, I was like, okay, because he was like, how was your last visit? And I, and I told him, and I was in a much more empowered embodied place. And I was just like, Hey, your colleague or another faculty member did this. And that was not okay. And then he was like, well, medical, the medical healthcare field is a touchy feely place. It's normal. And I, that's where I was like, no, in all the years that I've been a patient of healthcare or medical services, I've never been touched without my consent. And this is the first time it happened. And he was in shock because he did not probably didn't expect a response from a woman, an Asian person and someone younger. And so we were having a back and forth, but he was protecting his colleague and saying, well, you know, it's not, it's not a big deal. Like um, you're, you're just being too much. Oh, I hate that phrase because I heard it growing up from my parents being over too emotional and now hearing this. So with that said, it takes time to be able to develop in the internal capacity and to feel like you can because oftentimes your past experiences will block you from feeling like you and letting you know, like you can't. So like last, like yesterday, I was yesterday morning, I was on my way to pick up a book from a local bookstore and I was sexually harassed during the daytime. And I've come back and, and just showing like going from a place of like intentionally working on your relationship to your body and your emotions, you grow your capacity. And that's where you will notice shifts. And I noticed shifts within myself of like before when I was sexually harassed by men on the street, I would go in a freeze because of the conditioning of stay quiet. Don't make a scene, especially as a woman, because that's so bad. And then you 
put on the layer of being an Asian person. And then so yesterday when the guy was like, I was just window shopping and he just comes up to me and I was like, hey, let's go somewhere and have sex. And in that moment, I was like, no, leave me alone. Like I raised my voice, but it was because of the work that I've done internally where I felt like, you know, I gave myself permission. When someone's being a creepy asshole, I am going to raise my voice and make a scene. And so that's what I teach my clients is like, hey, you get to this place eventually, but we got to start small and doable because the nervous system does not like anything big, too fast, too soon. So that's why easing into do something, something different from um, unfamiliar because your body was like, well, we have all these recorded memories that we couldn't do this because this would happen. Shaming, punishment, um, being uh, ostracized, rejected, et cetera. So it's so important to have new experiences today where your mind and your body knows like it's okay. So it's so important to like practice with safe people, have a peer support group. And anywho, I can go all about this because I'm just like, I'm just imagining empowered Asian folks like being empowered and embodied and saying, no, this shit is not okay. I love it. And if anyone, um, you should follow Fung on her, um, Instagram. She's so inspirational and she does these amazing dances that she lets, you know, you have to feel the feel, you have to feel the anger, but also how do you let it go? And I think she does a great job by just doing these fun dances and it always makes me smile. Um, Jennifer, when it happens in the workplace, in the corporate world, when you see microaggression or you've been the victim of one, how have you dealt with it? I'm sure, you know, there are many examples, but what has worked for you? Yeah, and it's it's a couple of things that sort of come to mind when I think about that, because, you know, coming up in this business, it's sort of you know, we're in 2022, but when I think back of me coming up, like we didn't have a lot of these forums for conversations. So I grew up in a time where it was very, you, for me physically, right? I don't present a hundred percent Asian. So people were always a little bit, oh, she could be Hispanic, she could be Greek. So I was almost like an invisible Asian in the sense that people would say things because they didn't think they would be offending me, right? Because I was not uh, uh, overtly Asian to them. And unless I was very vocal about saying, and my Chinese mother, <clears throat> I talk a lot about that. Sometimes there are people in the room that I think are going to trip over their words with me that I try to get in front of them and say, and my Chinese mom would say, <laughs> to try to just like preempt some sort of dumb comment where they would really feel pretty crappy. But um, you know, my name doesn't sort of present that I'm, that I'm Asian. So I could almost hide it in a way. And I think there was a time that I did hide it because it was easier for me to blend in and not sort of embrace that Asian side until my mother would show up to school or show up to a, a you know, a work event or, or whatnot. But, um, you know, so these racial remarks, I think, would sometimes happen. And I think if you talked about the old Jennifer, I would say I sort of just took it on the chin. I grinned and bared it and I just let it happen. Sort of flashing forward now, I, similar to Fung, I feel like I have more, um, courage and a little bit more language in terms of how to um, react and what she talks about this freezing I don't necessarily feel like I ever froze but I was always in that like pause do it was almost like a quandary do I say something do I not say something do I react do I not react and I just even recently I live in a, live and work in the New York area and um, most of you probably follow the news feed that there have been a fair amount of Asian attacks in, in the country, let alone in the New York area, and recently in 2022 in the New York area. And someone in, in a meeting said, you know, oh, everyone's so excited to come back to the office and returning returning to the, the building is going to be great. And it, it got me, right? There was a little bit of like that physical, not rage, but sort of like I felt some blood moving. <laughs> and I said, I sat on the, my thoughts and I said, all right, let me cautiously just say, I think we should be careful about saying blanket statements like that because I think women are not so keen, caregivers might not be so keen, and our Asian community might not be so keen and, and anxious and eager to come back and commute on the New York City subway systems. And you could see the room sort of like, oh, did she just say that? 
And I said, you know what, it's okay. Because if it prompts a little bit of support and, and conversation, I think that's a, that's, that's a good thing. And I feel like there's always sort of my experience is like a refrigerator hum of difficult conversations and these microaggressions. And again, like I said, there was a version of me that would be very quiet about it and just sort of absorb it and take it. And sort of this new and improved version, or I think new and improved version of me is, is stepping into at least making people more aware. Because again, I think it goes back to Susie, what you said is that unless you experience it, like you don't know what it means to feel like I talked to a, an Asian woman on my team. I said, how are you feeling about trans, you know, um, transportation? She said, you know, I do it because I have to, but I put a hood on, I put one AirPod in and I have pepper spray in both hands. Okay. So she's able to, to go through her life feeling prepared and somewhat empowered, but that's pretty shitty. And so I want you know, everyone to sort of understand what it feels like to be her and traveling and commuting and whether we're sort of nudging people back. Um, it's not about everyone, right? It's about some people do feel great to be back and they should go back and other people might have hesitations and, and especially our Asian community, you know, in certain markets, I think that's a fair statement and they have fair reason to be uh, a little nervous. That's a great point, Jennifer. It just reminded me of the conversation. Um, I'm part of a, a senior leadership group at my at my agency, and the CEO would have these monthly meetings with us, and he's pushing people to go, come back into the office. And um, our building has, you know, very limited parking spaces, so not everyone can park in our building. And he calls out the one young, white, fit male in the group and says, <laughs> Hey, exactly. Andrew, I heard you love parking on the stream. You've been parking too for the last 11 years. Bravo <laughs> to you. And I'm like, excuse me, but if you're going to make us come back into the office, I want a parking pass and I don't want to pay for it. You know, so otherwise I'm going to continue working remotely. Um, right. we, I'm like, good for you, Andrew, park on the street all you want. Right. So exactly. I, fear for my life <laughs> and right. my fellow coworkers who don't feel comfortable. And they're like, Oh yeah. At night when you work late, I'm like, not even at night at the daytime. I mean, have you seen the news? Correct. So, it's, it's not, it's not subject to certain neighborhoods. It's not subject to certain days or, or times of the day. And again, I, you know, the city in general, I, I do feel safe, but again, it's more about if you feel good, great. But if you don't feel good and to our Asian community, I say, speak up too, because I've talked a lot about if you're not comfortable coming back, is there, do you need an Uber ride? Will that make you feel like, so you don't have to take the subways and maybe that doesn't even make you feel comfortable. And that's totally fine too. But again, I think that's a little bit about finding our voice to represent more than just the, the fit white male who feels that they can fend off an attacker versus, you know, someone that might feel a little bit more vulnerable and, um, you know, not, not quite as confident to, to travel so freely, you know, I, Hey, bless you. I, I'm so thrilled that you feel that way. But like I said, I have a colleague who literally is traveling like that through New, her, her days through New York city. And that's pretty awful. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about gaslighting. What is gaslighting? That term's been thrown around and, um, you know, we just talked through microaggression. It is somewhat related, but, you know, these are terms that are relatively new. And again, talking with that, you know, people don't think these things exist. What is gaslighting? Fung, you want to take a stab at the definition of that? <laughs> oh, yes. This is so familiar. I used to be a domestic violence counselor, but it can be, um, across the spectrum, but basically it's a form of manipulation that is intentionally done. So doubt in another person. And we're actually working with a client right now with um, advocating for herself at work is that she's been so gaslit her entire life that she's been working with a colleague who's doing that and she's been self gaslighting herself. So doubting herself. And so it takes time to actually begin to come out from, I call it the spell of gaslighting, where you can trust yourself because what gaslighting does is it disconnects you from like trusting yourself and doubting yourself. And that's where you end up really seeking validation approval outside of yourself because it's like, then you begin, because you question yourself so much, I, I can't trust myself to do this, et cetera. 
Jennifer, have you seen gaslighting in your career? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say um, I have. Again, I, it feels like gaslighting, like coupled with microaggressions somehow, it's like the one-two punch of it all. Mm-hmm. And is this little bit of, you know, it's trying to get you fired up and you you just, you know, again, it, it is something physical about your reaction to it. And you sort of either it's fight or flight in a lot of ways. And I think there's a lot of tendency, probably especially among Asian women to sort of, you know, do the flight part and flee away from that and not necessarily have the fight, um, be up for the fight every time. But yeah, I mean, I feel like there's been uh, instances where, uh, you know, again, it, it's directionally, it's usually from the, from males and that's unfortunate. And that's that dominating, you know, piece to things. And as we were talking about growing up, you know, in the Asian culture, the number one son, and, you know, obviously me being a daughter and, you know, a successful daughter, but still I wasn't the number one son and, uh, and you respect your elders. So I think there's, um, yeah, a peppering, uh, for sure of, of gaslighting. And I think it's really about trying to I, I, you know, I was going to say, I think it's about politely sort of getting yourself out of those situations. And I think now maybe it's not so polite. Maybe we have to be a little bit more direct in the conversation and direct in the offense that you've just made. And, you know, again, like I, I was, when I used that example of like, oh, you know, you're Asian. So of course you're good at math and analytics. And I roll my eyes and maybe rolling your eyes isn't the right response. Maybe it's more like, you know what, that's actually rude and it's assumptive and it's a stereotype and I don't appreciate it. And then just be done, you know, and get out of that situation right away, but be more direct and overt about your distaste for that behavior and those comments. Yeah, there, there's a great question that I'll piggyback on what you just said is, you know, now, now you're an executive. So when you were a more junior role, you know, how did you handle some of the misogyny and and racism? I know you mentioned that people didn't know that you were half Asian. So, but still you must've seen some misogyny as a woman. Yeah. Yeah. I I talk a lot about this with my Asian friends um, who are some mixed and some that are are fully Asian. And, you know, I'm sure as women, you probably have experiences. You just talked about sexual harassment on the street. I mean, there is definitely, you know, I'd get these comments like, oh, you're so exotic. And, you know, that again was just like those little dumb fetishisms that sort of just annoyed me. And just things about those kind of comments, you know, again, usually from men that made you uncomfortable and you didn't really know how to um, address it. And then you sort of saw a pattern of of behavior. So I think, um, you know, Growing up in this business, I think was hard. There's obviously this other expression about the bamboo ceiling. I, for me, I call it the bamboo electric fence. I felt like I was always sort of able to get close and then I would get a little zap, like mm-hmm, get back. And then I get close again, sort of get my achievements and I, mm, get back. And, you know, again, if you're an Asian female, it's, it's a little bit different, I think, in, in some ways than being an Asian male, but, but it's probably very similar. I mean, I think our Asian male counterparts probably feel, you know, somewhat, um, you know, similar in, in some of the um, sort of blockers or boundaries that are put in front of them because they're, the expectation is so different. But yeah, I, I felt, I, I, I definitely felt, you know, those exotic comments were the things that sort of pop up in my brain the most. That, and especially I would say like when I had red lipstick on and I was tan, you know, I'd blow my hair straight and it's like, oh, and, or like you'd wear something and you just get these dumb comments and it just really would, mm, I don't know. It's just like going back and remembering those. It's like, uh, I, I, I wish I could go back and have those conversations with those people. What would you say to them now? Now that you <clears throat> a little wiser, a little more bold. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm trying to think of this one, one instance that it happened, you know, in one instance, it was, it was a married guy. So I'm like, I don't know if your wife would appreciate you saying something like that to me. That would be one, one very (laughs) off the cuff comment, but I didn't say that (laughs) at the time. Uh, So I think, yeah, I mean, I feel like that would be one for sure a rebuttal. And um, I don't, I don't know. I think I, I, I think I'd still be a little bit speechless, but I, it's one of those things you probably do have to um, experience it and then take a pause and be prepared if it happens again. You know, it's almost like when people ask you, are you married yet? Do you have kids? Are you pregnant? 
Like you need that sound bite, you know, to, to respond to those annoying questions. And I think I, I need to come up with a, a, a PR statement for when someone says something completely uh, off the rails in that regard that, that is at the end of the day offensive. That's true. I, I saw earlier in the comments that when these things do happen to us and we recognize that it is microaggression or gaslighting, our first reaction is freeze. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we not react? I mean, we, we probably can't stop that, but how do we quickly then pivot to a better comeback, if you will, or, um, you know, to shut it down? How do we do that? Want to take this one fun? <laughs> oh, sure. Yes. Well, like I shared, because your your responses have been wired based on past experiences. So you need new experiences, but also like compassion for yourself of like, oh gosh, okay, this is an automatic response from my brain that's in charge of this freeze response. Okay, well, I can still have the opportunity at a later time. So if you're frozen that moment and you're and you recognize, because oftentimes you may not recognize. Um, and go on autopilot, you can like say like, hey, whether it's like conversation in person or email, like, hey, I noticed this happened yesterday. Can we talk about this? Um, or depending on what doable platform, because again, it's like working with doability that helps you to actually ease into doing what it is that you want. And so you, and you can just humanize it like, Hey, you know, like this is new for me. I don't usually say anything. And so this is hard for me to say, but it's important. So like, just really emphasizing, like, this is important for me. And that, and that's just like examples with even like my name, that was like something I had to learn and embrace, like pronounce my name correctly, because it's important to me. And I used to, and I was Phoebe for a couple of years until someone, I worked with was like, why are you called Phoebe? Isn't your name Fung Tao? And I'm like, yes, but all these white folks are like, your name's so hard. Can you just, can I just call you Tao or like some other American name? Because like when people call in, they can't pronounce your name. And then, so eventually I'm like, no, my name is important. So my name is Fung Tao. And I have to actually communicate to myself like, no, this matters. So uh -huh. I do that everyday life. Like going to coffee, how would you spell your name? And I take my time. I develop patience because I'm like, if I don't have patience with myself, I'm going to have patience with people. So it's just like that feedback loop of like, no, this is important. This matters. So I'm going to say something. And when you let someone know, like, this is important, they perk up their ears. Mm -hmm. That's just, but otherwise they're, but yeah, so that's a suggestion. Yeah. I had a similar instance where this, a gentleman was, it was a business meeting and um, he sort of made a reference about the movie Crazy Rich Asians and another movie and how it was like, you know, only black people like Black Panther and Asian people like Crazy Rich Asian, like something completely off the rails. And I, I, what I did was I actually took some time and I wrote him a note. So it wasn't, I didn't have to sort of verbally express myself. And I just said, you know, listen, I think that there there was a miss here and it came across in this way. And I wanted you to know that you, you, you sort of put, you arched a few people's backs on the call because of blah, blah, blah. And what was interesting, he wrote back like almost a 400 page essay because he was, he was someone who had adopted an Asian child. And he said, you don't, you don't uh, like, I, I, I don't want to be the guy that's like, but I'm not a racist because I have an Asian child. And he was basically saying like, he felt so terrible about his comments and that insensitive. And he really wanted some grace. So I, I understand that piece too, because again, I don't know if everyone's coming at it to be rude and aggressive and, and obnoxious, right? I think sometimes they, they fumble on their own words and they don't know how it's received. So it was a really wonderful exchange. And he, um, he even told his son about his son, 17, and he said it, it really opened up the conversation with his, within his own family. So the more you know, we can do that. Like I consider that a great win, right? So I had a moment. I didn't like how it made me feel. A few other people on the team didn't feel so great. Called the guy out on it. He recognized the sort of microaggression and, and acknowledged it and owned it and, and sort of vowed to do better. And so that to me is like, that's progress, right? So that's great. Yeah, there's, I'm going to start taking a few questions or popping in. Um, there's one, I'll, I'll keep him anonymous, but he's, he's having issues with his, um, his boss 
And, um, you know, she's the one kind of giving him the microaggression, but then she'll flip and then, you know, is really nice to him. Um, so he's sort of confused how to act where she shuts him down, but then, but then it's like, mm-hmm. oh, but he's doing a really good job. What, mm. how can he, he wants to talk to someone about her, mm-hmm. um, but it also doesn't want to, you know, jeopardize the relationship, sure. the working relationship. How yep. should he do that? I've, I've been in situations like that. And I, I, the best advice I was given is this idea of over, under, and through. So in other words, if this person isn't your person, they're just not your person. So you need to go over them, under them, and through them to get to whatever your goal is. So if your goal is about, I want to advance my career, I want to feel better about this. And then I think you need, and so you need to find those people who will represent you in conversations and in rooms where you are not. Um, And if this boss is the blocker, I think it's very fair. Again, we're in a different climate than we were five years ago. So this person can't be completely blind to Twitter and to the news feed and to the news cycle that if they really are sort of gaslighting you, doing microaggressions, being a bamboo ceiling blocker for you or an electric fencer, I think you, you owe it to yourself to have that conversation with them. It's like, I feel, you know, you don't have to accuse. I feel like you're not on my side. I feel like you're not helping me achieve the goals that I want. And here are the three things that are important to me. And if you really feel uncomfortable, I would say get an HR comrade and have that conversation together because then you're, you're calling this person out of, and that has to get their backup. Like if someone, an employee came to me with an HR comrade, I would definitely be like, crap, I'm on notice. I need to get my act together. And whatever vibe I'm giving off, whether purposely or not, I'm going to get that in check. So over under through would be my thing. Have a direct conversation. If you're not comfortable, um, find an HR person to to help you navigate that. Thank you, Jen. That's amazing advice. Um, And I see people quote you on that one. (laughs) (laughs) So it's awesome. Um, Fung, there's a question for you. If a person at work is an actual narcissist and it won't necessarily work to approach them, what what advice would you give? Ooh, actually, this is what I'm helping with the client right now is she want is um first engaging them directly. So one-on-one. And then if they grow, if they show action after action, like okay, they're just ignoring everything you said, not taking any responsibility. That's just the sign of a narcissist is never taking any responsibility. Everything is your fault. And if anything goes wrong, it's your fault. And then that's where you can go to the HR or like the person that um, was her boss. So she, so it was really up to her what she felt, com- what the client was comfortable doing. So at that point, it's just like, you can only do so much one-on-one, but if a person is an actual narcissist, they're going to deflect, deflect, deflect. And at that point, you need the support of HR or your boss. Nice. I hope that's helpful. i um, trying to scroll through if I missed any questions. Um, oh, also email because conversations are not recorded. So that's also like just having your proof as well. It's like through email engagements. And then just, again, when you report to HR, you have the documentation. So have an email trail. Yeah, definitely put it in writing. Um, It's super important. Yeah, I I recently had um, an issue with employee and we we just had to start document and that's how you make change happen. So very, very important. I was just, Susie, I was gonna comment on, Shelly wrote something in here about um, being uh, born and raised in the UK to Indian immigrant parents and sort of the naming issues that uh, we've all struggled with. And my story is that my parents, because they were immigrants, it was gonna be Jing Mei Cole or Katerina Cole, which was German. And both of them felt that they were too ethnic. So then they gave me the most popular name in the English language for like, I don't know, 15 years. And, you know, and then I purposely named my daughter Jade. So it wasn't, you know, overly ethnic, let's say, but it definitely gave. So when someone asks you, because people obviously ask us all the time, like, oh, how did you get, were you named after an aunt or, a, you know, a relative? 
And so she can say it was really to honor my Chinese heritage. And so she has sort of a story behind it. But yeah, naming is, is a big thing. And, you know, again, it goes back to what we started off talking about, about fitting in, blending in, not rocking the boat. And, you know, Fung has got, gotten to a place where she's like, my name and this is how, you know, versus Phoebe. But I know many, many in our Asian community and, and for sure have sort of anglicized and Americanized and um, Englished up their names. My mother had a Chinese name and an English name because she knew that one was going to make her life, you know, easier and one would sort of honor her, her culture and her heritage. But those are big, you know, it's two, two big things that you make a decision it was like a racist decision at birth for me, I guess is what it came down to. It's like, it was based on bias and, and you know, predicted racism. So they, they said Jennifer and my brother was named Michael, two, the two most popular names in, in the States for a very long time. Yeah, that, that's an interesting topic because I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, I should have, but I was born in Vietnam to a Vietnamese dad and a Chinese mother, um, but I was raised Chinese. So uh -huh. my Asian name, um, the original one was um, Bin Van Fung, P H U N G. Um, but in the Chinese pronunciation was Ping. So mm -hmm. it was so confusing for me growing up because the spelling looks like Bin, B I N H, but I was called Ping at home. And then, of course, when we got um, naturalized as citizens, they changed my name to uh, talk about an all-American name, Susie. Right. <laughs> and that's what I went. I became Susie, you know, in grade school. And they also changed the Vietnamese spelling of my last name to the Chinese spelling because I was being raised more Chinese. So it became mm -hmm. F-U-N-G. And it was like, wow, I was all over the place from like an identity standpoint that, you know, and then sure. now it's, you know, I've adopted my married name, Bao. Um, and um, I'm actually divorced now, but I kept it because my kids, <laughs> I don't right. want to be different from my own kids. Um, but I, I gave them um, American first names, Chinese middle names, and hoping that, you know, when they grow up, it's their choice. They can use either one, whatever they feel most identified with. So we're, we're getting close again, but I'd love for each of you to kind of give your advice to um, this group here of, you know, what's, what's the one thing you can tell our API community on how to deal with difficult conversations, um, Going forward, um, please do fun. You know, you've helped so many people as a career now. Um, what 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 advice would you give? Well, many of the folks that I help are of the AAPI community, and what the number one fear is um, rocking the boat. So to re-relate -re to it today is rock the boat, because when you don't rock the boat, you stay on the same course. So when you rock the boat, you change course. You change and that creates a cultural revolution where, you know what, let's, let's get comfortable with necessary discomfort. That's different than unnecessary discomfort. But once you become familiar with necessary discomfort in your body with certain emotions, you will rock the boat more and you inspire other people to do the same. Like when I spoke up during my dental appointment, the dental student was of a Muslim woman. And she was like, thanks for sharing that because the, because the faculty members, they touch me when I talk and that's against my culture or my religion for another man to touch me as if for my husband. But you like having that courage to say something inspired me to say something to like, um, to the men that keep touching me, like, don't touch me. So just you, even you may even be in the first, like be a trailblazer. Like I used to be, you know what, be the trailblazer. Instead of being the black sheep, be the trailblazer. Because actually a white man helped me re-relate to this too. It's like, you're the trailblazer because you're paving a new path for others to walk on that path. Again, changing course from the old ways that you were told like, hey, this is the path to walk. Now let's do something different. So that would be my advice. And also, okay, I know, but create a pre-care, during-care and post-care plan when you're having 
difficult conversation. I would say amplify your self-care and community care because it's hard. So reach out for support, create a peer support system at work because don't do this by yourself. Don't be in isolation. And the antidote to isolation is connection. So reach out to your folks, build your community. And that's how we're going to create a cultural revolution. So let's rock the fucking boat. Thank yes. <laughs> one, one quick question for the panel before we move into uh, your closing advice, Jennifer. This is from Tatiana. Um, what are ways that allies can go about supporting Asians um, without making them feel spotlit? in these uncomfortable moments? Yeah, I mean, I would say in, you know, I think it's maybe not so much about, um, it's almost like representing communities and it's, you know, it's our Asian community, which is who we're focusing on today, but communities in general um, in, in the rooms where we might not be, right? So like, let's just say that conversation I described earlier happened and there were no Asian women in the room. I would, I would hope, right, a real ally would say, hey, you know what? our Asian community might not feel so great about traveling on our subway system. So let's represent them, even though they not they are not in the room. I think allies can sort of have their um, ears perked up and their, their antenna up for us in, in moments. And I don't think it's about like, so, and Jennifer, what do you think, right? Cause that, that does probably feel a little bit more, um, you know, like you're putting someone on the spot. But I think it's also knowing knowing the people that you're um, being allies for. Some people like Fung might be the exact person. Like I, what I was going to build on her comment is that, you know, some of us are really comfortable in that, you know, idea of rocking the boat and trailblazing. And some of us might not be just by, by sheer nature. And I think that's OK, too. But you, but I think the encouragement is to find your way of defining what trailblazing means and rocking the boat. And maybe your rock is a little like this and Fung's is more like this and that's okay. So I think allies having their radar up for us, um, representing us when we're not in the room, sort of looking at it with, with our um, filter on because, you know, again, going back to that thought of you don't know what it feels like unless you have felt it, right? You don't know what a microaggression is unless you have had a microaggression against you, whether, you know, even if it's a different you know, circumstance. So um, pointing that out, I think is okay. Like that word casting, like I, I often say, like, I don't really favor that word. I don't think we should be saying we're casting people in presentations. It's not my favorite, favorite terminology. So I hope other people sort of, you know, gravitate towards th things like that, whether it's the word or, or something else. No, that's great advice, Jennifer, because just the other day I spoke to someone, you know, same situation where she's hesitant to speak up, rock the boat. And I gave her the advice as, you know, find that ally or partner or API person and, you know, team up when you're mm -hmm. going into a meeting or a situation, have each other's back. If mm -hmm. that person happens to be API, great. If they are an ally, great. But at least you had know one other person in that room is going to have your back. And so it doesn't feel like you're rocking the boat by yourself. You're rocking the boat because you have an entire you know, support system mm -hmm. behind you. And that's why, you know, we love the Asians in advertising community because this is your, your community. Like we're yeah. all here to back you up, whatever it is you're feeling. Yeah. Absolutely. But I know, I know we put in the chat, um, how to get in touch with you, Uncaged Path, your Instagram, Jennifer, your LinkedIn, um, any other closing advice, um, for the audience, Jennifer? Yeah. I mean, I think, it, it sort of ties back to what Fung said is that, you know, your, your body does have physical reactions. So whether it's really like a freezing moment or, but if you're in, in a situation where you, you suddenly do feel that uncomfortable, that little flush, that little, whatever, whatever it is for you, sort of listen to that. Like, you know, just really pay attention to it because I think there's, you know, there's one way to do it and you just like, you, you eat it and swallow it and you move on in your day. And there's another path where you sort of address it in your way that you're comfortable with. Cause not everybody is, whether Asian or not is going to be comfortable sort of like really going at it. Um, and then that, that approach that I took of not necessarily, cause I think sometimes the verbal or physical interaction with someone is what gets our bodies a little nervous. Like, oh, I don't want to talk to her or him because 
So writing it down on paper or an email, very short and sweet. It does not have to be a diatribe, but just, you know, a few sentences, but whatever that, that thought is. And again, I gave you that one example where it really led to something really, for me, wonderful. Like it was a, a great lesson for me to not sit with it, to not eat it, to not swallow it, but to, to send it out into the universe. And, and, and if he never wrote me back, I would accept that, you know, but I know that I can look myself in the mirror and say, I tried today to push us as a community forward. And that's important that, and, and to your point about look for the people in those rooms that want, that will be your supporters and people that are like you, me, for me, the Asian community, but the mixed community too, was really wonderful. Like that was, you know, people that really understood what it was like to sort of not be a hundred percent, you know, either in an, either territory and be able to hide your Asian-ness that was a very big common bond for me for, for finding those sorts of people as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Fung. It was Thank such you. a great conversation. It's so needed. And I hope uh, everyone got a piece of advice or inspired. Stand up for yourself. You know, you've got allies, friends, supporters.